everyone, and welcome to another edition of Breaking Down Barriers from H2IO. I'm Jenna, Executive Director, and as I'm sure that you are now very familiar with, this program really helps tackle a lot of the different stigmas and um, challenges that people face impacted by Huntington's disease. We've done some pieces on um, barriers around research and um, misinformation about different techniques and things with research, but today we're going to really talk about some of those other barriers that people have when it comes to grief and loss, which is a very complicated uh, discussion point, and many of us in the community face it without even knowing it. Um, so we wanted to bring on one of our, our friends and partners, Corey, with um, the Huntington uh, Society of Canada, to be able to talk about one of his specialties, which is understanding grief and loss and how to manage that. So Corey, welcome. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Jenna. Yeah, uh, I'm a social worker, and I've been uh, with the Huntington Society of Canada for over 30 years. Um, I have worked in various roles, uh, always in the capacity of a social worker, and currently I hold the title of National Social Worker. So I am helping um, create virtual programs that are run nationally um, across Canada, and I'm also overseeing the Youth Mentorship Program and working along with our partners like HDO and supporting youth across the world uh, that are growing up in HD families. That's amazing. And just a little bit about you. How did you start to get into this field? Um, it's a very specialized field and you've been in it um, for several years. I'm not going to say a lot of years, but uh, several years. <laughs> but how did you find out of this passion for Huntington's disease? Well, it wasn't a passion in the beginning. It was a selfish motive. Uh, I was, I got my job a year, uh, no, I got my job with the Huntington Society a year after I graduated with my undergrad. I was working at a hospital uh, that had uh, a cluster of social workers and there was a contract position with the Huntington Society of Canada that was um, kind of being circulated through the department over time. Um, it was five hours and uh, I had to start paying back my student loan and my student loan was $136 a month and the Huntington Society's salary for that month was $150. So I thought, all right, I'll take this on so um, I can pay off my student loan. And here I am 30 years later, uh, working third generation with the families in my area, uh, and now getting the opportunity to meet families from all over the world um, because of my work that I do with HDO. Um, and so here I am, I, I, I'm like a, a cat that got fed some warm milk and won't leave. <laughs> Well, and you've been so instrumental to HDY over the years with supporting um, at the inception of it, helping with camps, uh, speaking at our virtual congresses and our in-person congress this last year in Glasgow, um, and being a big champion and, and helping us partner with um, the mentorship program, which we were able to utilize the learnings and resources that you all have done to bring that to the U.S. and um, potentially even beyond. So thank you so much for being such a loyal and important partner for HDYO. You're welcome. Pleasure. So let's tackle. Um, let's let's start a little bit with understanding um, a little bit about some of the challenges with Huntington's disease. I think that um, for people who aren't familiar with HD, it can seem, or if you just hear one person's journey with Huntington's disease, it's easy to label one person's experience as something that happens to everybody. Um, which we know is not really the case because there are so many um, very specific relationships that we all face. And then you add in the component of being a young person and going through um, a very long life cycle of, of impacts of Huntington's disease. So can you share a little bit about some of the challenges that young people face when impacted by HD? Sure. Uh, as most people watching this would know, HD is a genetic disease. Um, and subsequently, because of that 50-50 chance, percent chance of inheriting the gene that someday will turn on, it's a multifaceted uh, challenge to juggle. We also know that Huntington's is a very complicated disease and it kind of affects um, every part of a person once it starts to demonstrate its symptoms. Um, and so I like to always say that this is not an individual disease, this is a family disease. So some of the challenges are that I've experienced in my years of working with the communities is oftentimes 
parents um, want to allow kids to remain innocent. Um, they uh, want them just to be kids and to have fun. And so there's a lot of secrecy that can happen around the disease. Um, there can be a lot of um, white lies that can get told to kind of uh, talk away some of the things that they may overhear. Um, and so I think one of the big deals is that um, in the absence of information, we're going to come up with our own thoughts, our own belief systems. And oftentimes for kids, those are inaccurate um, and they can lead to internalized feelings of fear. They can lead to internalized feelings of uh, shame or guilt. Um, and isolation is a huge problem as well. Um, so there is that whole piece around um, young people watching people that they love change and lose things that regular adults are still able to do, like drive, like work, um, and uh, oftentimes way longer than um, probably is healthy. Uh, families don't start talking about it with their kids in time. Mm -hmm. I think that that's that's so true and that's been um I think a great a great summation of, of the importance of being open and, and sharing about Huntington's disease because there's a there's a vast difference with someone who is comfortable talking about HD and hears about it at a young age compared to someone who hears about it after they've already gone through career planning or family planning and some of that can't be helped but um there are so many different layers to that because young young people are living the most influential parts of their lives at this time and then having Huntington's disease layer on top of that can create what can seem like insurmountable challenges. Exactly. And I think another, you know, uh, hallmark of this disease process is the age of onset to this disease is, uh, you know, 35 to 50 uh, for an adult. And most kids that are in a family that has a parent with HD, you know, they're coming to the point where they're having to make big life decisions for themselves, uh, uh, post-secondary school or going to high school even. So there's often um, a real struggle for some around um, following their own dreams and aspirations and meeting the expectations or the belief of the expectations that their family have. So oftentimes they can hold themselves back because they need to be helpful around the house. They, uh, they don't feel like uh, there's money to be had to go to post-secondary school. Uh, so they, they you know, kind of um, nip their own dreams in order to support a family. Yeah, which comes with so many different underlying feelings and emotions behind that. And just to try to grapple with that and not have that guilt. And then the last thing that I think is really uh, unique to this disease uh, is the privacy. Yeah. You know, for many, many, many years in Canada, we didn't have protection around that genetic information. And so it was a secret to the in the family. Um, and meanwhile, you know, there are all these crazy things that can be happening behind the doors of the family home. Um, and whether it's overt or covert, there's this information that we don't talk about outside the door. So, you know, kids are going to school and they're sad or they don't have meals or those kind of things. So they have to start from a very young age to protect themselves and protect their families. Um, and again, that just fosters isolation, that fosters depression, that can foster anxiety. Um, and so again, I, I really advocate for open communication around this disease as soon as it feels like uh, it's necessary. Yeah, and then you add on top of that, just the whole question of should I get tested and when is best for me? And it, it's just a heavy load that young people carry. Exactly. Yeah. So kind of in parallel with this, we've set the stage a little bit for what some of the challenges are for young people impacted by HD. Let's talk a little bit about grief and loss, because I think people have their own definitions of what it means to them and can kind of lump things together. Um, but it's really a very complicated subject. So can you share a little bit about what the definitions are of each and, um, you know, some of the assumptions that you've heard from the community when they're trying to describe it for what it means to them? Yeah, sure. So lots of people associate grief with the loss of someone that we care about uh, by uh, to death, 
Um, and uh, while that is the most significant loss and the most permanent loss, um, as humans, we are hardwired to connect. We are hardwired to attach. So anything that we connect with and attach to that is very valuable to us, if we lose that, that can create the response that is the same response as if someone died. So grief is the, um, uh, the uh, internal experience uh, of reaction to a loss of something that we value. Mm -hmm. So it can be a job, it can be a pet, it can be um, uh, a family member, it can be a community. Right. If you're young and your parents move and you have to move schools and you leave all your friends behind, that can be a real significant loss for people. So some of the myths about this uh, about this topic are that we only grieve when someone dies. So I think I just answered that. Uh, we grieve at any time, all the time uh, that we are alive around varying things. I think the intensity of that grief is different depending on the attachment or the significance of the thing that we are losing. Um, grief is just an emotional reaction to loss is another um, myth. Um, it is a very emotional process for people, but it also affects us both physically, mentally, and uh, behaviorally. It, it changes us. We will never be the same after we've had a significant loss in our life. Um, it changes our beliefs about the world. It changes our hopes and our dreams. Um, and the world no longer remains as sparkly as it might have been when we were young. Another um, common myth is that grief is linear. Um, we know that in the beginning, when grief was first starting to be studied and understood, we our, our forerunner, uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, talked about five stages of grief. Uh, she talked about first there's denial, and then there's anger, and then there's a bargaining stage, and then there's a depression stage, and then finally we get to acceptance. So it made it sound like it was very linear. And what we now know is that grief is extremely messy. Um, and there are way more um, kind of common themes that happen as someone's going through grief, and we will one day be here, and then the next day we'll be way up here and then something happens and we slide back here. So it is a fluid process um, that people are experiencing um, for various amounts of time. One of the other myths that we have is that grief should last no longer than uh, one year. And that is actually a very long uh, time frame when you think about most of the, the uh, North American um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Processes or uh, policies around um, taking time off work because a loved one has died. You know, if if it's a distant relative, you get the day of the funeral off. If it's a parent or a brother, you might get two or three days off, and then you're expected to jump back into work. So there's this belief that it happens, but we don't want to give it too much space, and just let's move on with things. Um, which kind of leads me into the next myth, and that is that everybody grieves in the same way, and they don't. Uh, every uh, person's grief experience is, is an extremely personal uh, experience. Uh, it is based on the relationship and the type of relationship that they had with the person or the job or whatever it is that's, that's being lost. Uh, it has to do a whole lot with culture and the rituals associated with how we acknowledge loss and death. Um, it is um, based on what we're allowed to do in terms of uh, balancing the needs of ourselves and other people. Um, so it's a very uh, personalized thing and it can last a lifetime. Um, it can last a lifetime. Yeah, that's, that's so well put. Thank you for going into that. Um, and I think that as we're kind of building the stage for connecting the two with the community, and then also how there are many chances and, um, and instances of grief and loss and coping, um, I think that that was a great definition to help bridge those two communities, the communities and, and grief and loss together. Um, 
So now thinking back to young people impacted by HD, what are some of the instances that they could experience grief and loss throughout this particular point of their life? Yeah, so uh, I think the moment that people learn about HD in their family, a grief response starts. Um, again, you know, depending on the knowledge and how much information that they have, it immediately shifts their future direction. Um, it is, uh, it, it impacts on the roles that they see various family members had and are losing or no longer being capable of doing. Um, it impacts on family finances often. Um, and so perhaps if there was a family who traveling was really important um, for them, they no longer can afford to do that. Uh, there are those opportunities. Um, grief can happen repeatedly in, in this process because we know that Huntington's disease is a progressive disease. Um, and so we're constantly having to acknowledge, grieve, and adapt to the changes um, that are happening as our loved one's um, uh, disease progresses. Um, so those are some of the things that happen real, real quick. I think some of the other options that happen or the possibilities that can happen when this disease uh, is that people lose the, themselves. Um, you know, the young people are often expected to have a lot of responsibility to help out. Uh, so they're not perhaps capable of hanging out with their friends in the same way because they need to be at home or they're not able to uh, participate in extracurricular activities because a there's maybe no money or maybe they uh, again the responsibility is you get home after school you need to help look after mom because I have to go to work right so they're the whole they grow up very very quickly in these families um, there are lots of social connections I've worked with a lot of individuals and if their parent is experiencing some behavioral disturbances or it's um the um, the home environment is unpredictable. You don't know what what you're going to get when you open up the door. A lot of kids don't get to socialize. They don't get to hang, have their friends over to the house because it might be too much and the affected person may uh, start to get very angry and explosive. And then there's a lot of embarrassment and fear and all those kind of things. So it's just easier to not connect with people in your own home. Um, there's a loss of safety, right? Okay, so again, we know for some individuals, the behavioral responses to this disease can be pretty extreme. Um, and so it can create a lot of uncertainty in the home. Uh, can, you know, people can live in a state of fight or flight for long periods of time when, when the person with the disease is awake, because you never know what might trigger an outburst. Um, so uh, the climate in a home can be very tense. Um, it can be uh, happy. There's lots of happy times. This is not always a negative thing, um, but it doesn't um, it, it doesn't necessarily last for very long before something happens, and uh, you know you see the partner or some other kid who is crying because of something that's happened related to the disease process of of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, again, we talked briefly around the testing process. So in my experience, you know, uh, there's a very small percentage of individuals who are eligible for testing who actually do test. Um, and more often than not, when they make those decisions to test, it's mostly around career decisions or family planning decisions. Uh, so we've, you know, I've experienced young, uh, intelligent, bright people who want to go on and be dentists or they want to go on and be physicians. So they get tested and they find out that they're carrying the gene. So they have to not always have to, but they can sometimes have to alter um, their, their dream about their occupation, about their career. Because if I'm going to have this disease, do I really want to spend 10 years in school? Or do I want to do something that is kind of in the field uh, of healthcare in some way that has a shorter um, training process so that I can get on and enjoy the number of years that I have while I have them, 
right? So that changes things. Some people decide not to have children, even though they wanted to have kids all their lives. So things are constantly moving and in flux and, and changing um, all the time. The other big piece is relationships. You know, how do you, how do you, um, how do you talk about this disease with people that you care about? Uh, how does that impact on the frequency that you get to have contact with the people that you care about? How do you even start to talk about this when you're dating? Um, and you know, how do you, what do you talk about uh, when it comes to this disease? And when do you start to talk about it? All of those things are um, profound weights that our young people are carrying around and feeling, again, like they don't have anyone to talk to quite often about these things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one of the things, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, was that grief isn't linear and it doesn't really go away. It can evolve. And I think sometimes in an effort to be supportive, friends and family may say things like, um, you're only given as much as you can handle and you'll be stronger for it. But the reality is, is that it doesn't go away. So can you share a little bit more about some of those like instances where from the outside, it can seem that again, that you're just expected to get over it, but really it's there and it lingers and it changes. Yeah. I get, great point. I think, um, in my experience, when, when young people do share something about Huntington's disease or a parent that's experiencing this or a sibling that's experiencing this, they only give a little bit of information, right? So it's kind of like the, we only see the tip of the iceberg. We don't see everything that's underneath the surface. Um, and so uh, particularly around the topic of grief and loss, people say a lot of stupid things in uh, the couch of a support, right? <laughs> um, you know, God needed another angel, all of those kind of things, right? So um, most often those kind of placating comments are uh, hopefully meant in a supportive way. But I think also it is mostly around helping the individual manage their own discomfort with this, right? We don't want to see people we care about sad and upset. And so we want to kind of smooth that over as quickly as possible so we can get back to the friend that we know more often than this 10% of the time that they're just showing up in a really different state. Um, so they do, uh, you know, again, that takes about three or four times. And then again, my experience is that people say, you just don't get it. And they stop sharing, right? So again, they become much more uh, uh, isolated. Uh, things are kept in a cylinder and there's only very few spaces that it feels okay to even breathe about what's happening in their own selves uh, as they are watching this family chaos unfold around them. I think it's human nature to want to fix a problem. And whether that's your own problems or someone else's problems to say, okay, now it's better. And unfortunately, this is a particular topic where that that isn't really the case. And um, I think it's important, especially for friends out there who are listening along, or even professionals who maybe don't know exactly what to say, is to let people just talk. Because just talking is so powerful and, and to acknowledge the fact that it's okay for them to feel like that, especially when you're talking about some of those guilts and some of those different challenges, because you can't, you're not going to be able to fix it. Right. And so an attuned relationship is so valuable and you don't need to have 50, but you really need to have one. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Somebody who gets it, somebody who may not get it, and that doesn't matter but they're going to show up and they're going to listen and they're going to be present. Yeah. Who want to understand you as a person. They don't necessarily need to be that expert in what they're experiencing, but they can be there for you. For sure. yeah. So what, so we've talked a little bit, we've laid the groundwork for what grief is and, and loss and how um, it can show up in Huntington's disease. Um, what are um, some of the coping strategies that people can utilize um, when they find that grief is trickling in or as they continue to grieve the loss of, of whatever they're experiencing? Uh, it's a great point. And again, um, self-care is kind of the buzzword that gets thrown around. And, you know, when as soon as we say self-care, there's a kind of a list that drops down real quickly um, that is very common across the board, whether it's common practice for people. 
there's usually things like physical exercises are a great way of managing this. Um, you know, managing your relationship with food or various substances um, and making sure that you're keeping those things in check is another kind of drop down menu that often gets talked about. Um, uh, you know, having a hot bath, uh, you know, there are very specific things, but I think what you need to do best is know yourself and know, uh, you know, what do I do when I'm stressed? What seems to help? What doesn't seem to help? And create a list for yourself um, that will uh, give you the opportunity to um, maintain yourself in, in a very um, sometimes difficult situation. So things are proper sleep, um, proper nutrition, some form of exercise. I don't care what that looks like. If you turn on your favorite song and you dance like a crazy person in your kitchen, that's exercise. And it's getting movement and energy uh, moving in your body so it doesn't feel so heavy um, and stuck. Um, it can be talking to a good friend. Uh, it can be watching a Netflix series that's really important or that you really enjoy. And it just gives you an escape for a brief period of time. Uh, it can be going to uh, walk in nature, uh, having a hot bubble bath, um, you know, candles that smell, aromatherapy. All of those things can be really, really helpful. Um, I think one of the biggest things that uh, can be really helpful for people, and this is a biased comment given our profession, but uh, counseling, seeking support from, uh, you know, the people that are in your community that are professionally connected to Huntington's disease, but also uh, are connected to the disease uh, from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much value in mutual support and mutual support is uh, finding your community that completely understands without explanation mm -hmm. um, can be so, so helpful. And again, you don't have to drop into that part very often, but sometimes it's very, very helpful when all the other things don't seem to be working. I think when, you, when we were at Congress in March, um, mm -hmm. it was so amazing because I think that that experience of coming together for the first time in a long time because of the pandemic, but then also the first time for many of these people who have been able to be in a room filled with others who just get it was so overwhelming in every sense of the word. And I think at one point, everybody who attended um, released in some way or, for, uh, or fashion. And I think the importance of even things like attending these kinds of events or um, support groups or following along online where you can do it and you can be the judge of how engaged you want to be. But having that larger community of strangers around you who also understand, I think is such a powerful thing that people can sometimes underestimate. But just to not have to define the disease, but just to be with people who understand it is it's so powerful. And you know what? The disease goes away when when you get together. Um, in, in Canada, we have young people affected by Huntington's disease and we have uh, YPAD days. So that's the acronym for that. Um, and we often will have people that have, it's their first time to anything associated with Huntington's disease and they come in terrified. And yes, we put together a curriculum that talks about things that are familiar to HD and young people. Um, but on those breaks, on those evenings, when, when out of session is happening, they're just being young people connecting and those connections last for years and years to come. And it could be connections with someone that lives in Ontario that's made a friend who lives in BC and they use all the social media platforms to kind of maintain that contact and they can't wait till the next time that they get to see each other in person. Um, those kind of relationships are phenomenal. And I think that these are the, the, the golden nuggets that are your community, my community, we offer. Um, and honestly, I, I just wish everybody could attend those. Um, but many people are very fearful of doing that, right? It's easier to kind of avoid rather than confront because it might be too overwhelming. It might be this, and it might be for a period of time. But we also don't nail you to a chair and say, because you know, you're know you here, you have to sit here. We have breakout rooms where people can just go and they can just chill. Um, usually um, you know, supported by a professional who understands this disease and who can 
help support them in those really difficult moments. And they don't last long, right? And then you're back up and you're back in with your peers. And uh, how many times have you heard, Jenna, oh my God, finally landed somewhere where I don't even have to tell people about it. They just get it. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's so amazing. And I think that um, those in-person connections are invaluable and thinking about the global community, sometimes that's not always available to be able to do. Um, but just to do in some plugs with, there are an international events and uh, regional events where they do offer scholarships. So if it's something that you feel like you can't attend because of a barrier like cost, or that could be an, a, a thing that is a little bit of a hesitancy for you, then I think, you know, explore that option with, with those different event organizers to see if there could be an opportunity. But even I think sometimes social media gets a bad rap because um, there are a lot of things that can happen on social media that can be unhealthy. But what social media allows you to do, especially for those in cultures or in families where you can't be open about Huntington's disease for a variety of different reasons, you can still feel that sense of a community, but still be a little bit at an arm's length away until you are ready to reach out or you, you do have that opportunity. So I think that there's value in all of these different ways of, of feeling that sense of community. And it's all ultimately what's best for the individual for what makes sense. But for sure, if you can go to an in-person event, because I think that it is a life-changing experience. Right. And if you can't because of geography or like you say, because of um, just what's happening in people's homes, uh, if you can't, um, I, I got to tell you, uh, ironically, when I started the role of starting virtual programming, um, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. Um, and I was a little hesitant about it, but we didn't have it. Uh, this was before COVID stole my thunder and everyone's doing virtual stuff. Um, but I got to tell you, we, in our very first pilot project of doing an at-risk and gene-positive group, uh, we had eight uh, younger people from across Canada that were joining us for this, and we were meeting bi-weekly. And it took two sessions before the same thing that I would see if we were meeting in person occurred online. And every group that we have run, I did nine, I think, in total, um, before I handed it off to some of my uh, colleagues, and I'm going to start developing something different. Every single one of those groups have maintained contact after the end of the group. Awesome. That's so awesome. Um, so as we think about wrapping up, um, we've mentioned this a little bit, but what would you suggest are some proactive ways that young people can be their own advocate when it comes to managing and coping with grief and loss? So I think accepting the fact that this is going to be a bumpy road and there's going to be high points and there's going to be low points and starting to build your own personal team for those low points. Um, and that I would suggest are a combination of friends, of family, and also professionals and get to know those people before there's a crisis so that you can uh, easily lean into those relationships when you need them the most without fear of rejection or misunderstanding or any of those kind of things. Um, again, HDO has a gazillion great little programs, Huntington Society of Canada and Huntington's Disease Association or the United States. They also have very great programming for um, young people. So, uh, you know, explore that if that is something that you're curious about. Um, ask questions about that and get involved um, and and learn, right? Education is not, our knowledge is, is strength. Um, and it, it, it can be stuff that we're afraid of, but, but it's oftentimes bigger when we just assume or we don't know than it is when we actually know. Yeah. So those things are really, really important. Um, and I think, again, it's probably a smaller percentage of people that actually heed that and I my experience has been they cope better as they go through this process right making connections that are outside of their normal social circles can be so valuable as people start to decide around testing or not testing mm -hmm. yeah so what are your let's wrap this conversation up Corey I know you have an analogy of, of how to try and digest all of this information <laughs> that we've presented, because it can be really heavy and it can be challenging because maybe if you're watching this, 
you might be going through a high point. So to think about how to manage grief and loss when you're at a high point can, can maybe not be something that you want to do or, or vice versa. So how can we wrap up this conversation for the community to, to feel like they, they can kind of move forward with this? One thing before we go um, into the final wrap up comment, I wanted to um, talk about anticipatory grief just for a second, because um, I, 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 I joke all the time that I'm known as the grief and loss guy. And, and then my next statement is, but I'm really a lot of fun at the party, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> um, but it's amazing to me because I do this work and it's kind of like my language. How many people have never heard or know what anticipatory grief is? And anticipatory, anticipatory grief is actually grieving before the loss has happened. So you're anticipating um, the end to something. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be, um, you know, uh, waiting for your test results, right? There's a certain response that happens in that moment uh, where you're already anticipating a positive result. Um, there is a grief that can happen if the test result is actually negative because you spent so many years kind of planning for how you're going to be as a gene positive person and all of a sudden your identity gets shifted. Uh, every time a parent or a loved one, uh, you know, moves down to a, a lower level uh, function, there's a grief response. And then we start to anticipate what's going to come next. And we ultimately know at some point, maybe long-term care is going to be an issue or eventually death is going to be an issue. So we're constantly preparing ourselves inside internally for uh, trying to maintain some control over an uncontrollable process. Um, so anticipatory is a grief is a part of all of our lives in this community. And if you need more information about that, please reach out to someone who knows a little bit about that so that they can help normalize your experience um, and support you through that. No, thank you so much for bringing that up. That's a really important thing. So in summary, for those who have heard me speak, you probably would have heard this because um, I was provided with a definition of grief, if you will, um, from one of my friends um, after I had lost a friend and he randomly just sent me this link to a Reddit article. And it was an, a response to someone that said, I just lost my best friend and I don't know what to do. And an older gentleman replied back. And so I'm just going to read you this because it's a beautiful description of what grief really is outside of all this clinical talk. So, uh, all right, here it goes. I'm old. What that means is that I've survived so far and a lot of people I've known and loved have not. I've lost friends, best friends, acquaintances, co-workers, grandparents, mom, relatives, teachers, mentors, students, neighbors, and a host of other folks. I've had no children and I can't imagine the pain it must be to lose a child. But here's my two cents. I wish I could say you get used to people dying. I never did. I don't want to. It tears a hole through me whatever, whenever somebody I love dies, no matter the circumstances. But I don't want it to not matter. I don't want it to be something that just passes. My scars are a testament to the love and the relationship that I had for and with that person. And if the scar is deep, so is the love. So be it. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are a testament that I can love deeply and live deeply and be cut or even gouged but I can heal and continue to live and continue to love. And the scar tissue is stronger than the original flesh ever was. Scars are a testament to life. As for grief, you'll find it comes in waves. When the ship is first wrecked, you're drowning with wreckage all around you. Everything floating around you reminds you of the beauty and the magnificence of the ship that was and is no more. And all you can do is float. You find some piece of the wreckage and you hang on for a while. Maybe it's some physical thing. Maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who is also floating. For a while, all you can do is float, stay alive. In the beginning, the waves are 100 feet tall and they crash over you without mercy. They come 10 seconds apart and don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find that the waves are still 100 feet tall, but they come further apart. When they come, they still crash all over you and wipe you out. 
but in between you can breathe, you can function. You never know what's going to trigger the grief. It might be a song, a picture, a street intersection or the smell of a good cup of coffee. It can be just about anything and the wave comes crashing, but in between waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everybody, you find that the waves are only 80 feet tall or 50 feet tall. And while they still come, they come further apart. You can see them coming, an anniversary, a birthday, Christmas time or Thanksgiving. You can see it coming for the most part and prepare yourself. And when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will again come out the other side, soaking wet, sputtering, still hanging onto some tiny piece of the wreckage, but you'll come out. Take it from an old guy, facts. The waves never stop coming and somehow you really don't want them to, but you learn that you'll survive them and other waves will come and you'll survive those as well. If you're lucky, you'll have a lot of scars from lots of loves and a lot of shipwrecks. Uh, Corey, I've heard that before and I needed that today and I didn't even know it till I, till you were going through those beautiful words. And I think that that is a phenomenal way to eloquently describe what it's like. I, I love that description and people just get it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you so much, Corey, for everything that you do, have done and continue to do for the community, for being here today to share your important perspective and wisdom about this very difficult topic. Um, for those of you watching at any point, please feel free to reach out to any of us in the community. But if you're struggling with trying to find a local resource, please also reach out to HDYO because we can help connect you with someone who may be able to help. Um, so you can contact us at hdyo.org. Um, and uh, if you want to view Corey's presentation at Congress, that's available at our YouTube channel. It's at HDYO feed on YouTube. And we have a um, all of our Congress sessions are available on that particular playlist. So it, earmark this conversation um, or bookmark, I should say, bookmark this conversation, bookmark that conversation or whatever else um, for resources and, and educational tools that are out there that are best for you. But I, yeah. I think that uh, the presentation that I did at the HDO Congress, um, I, I think it's more like a podcast because I don't think the camera works. So you just get to hear me. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what happened. I haven't looked at it, but um, I got an email shortly thereafter saying there was a technical issue, but that they were still putting it up, but it was just going to be the um, audio. Interesting. I will take a look at that because I have the original file. So I'll make sure what's on YouTube is right. Thank you for letting me know. But still, you could have a podcast. <laughs> but thank you so much, my friend. Um, we so appreciate you. And um, this will conclude uh, this month's edition of Breaking Down Barriers. And again, you have a community there to support you. Thank you all so much.